This is my ranking of Halo Infinite's levels, starting with its worst and finishing with its number one. Unfortunately, as with any ranking like this one, there has to be a mission dubbed the worst in the game, and for me, it's Nexus. I would also like to acknowledge at this early stage that there's really not much separating the majority of levels which unfold within Forerunner structures quality-wise. Just because this one is dead last, please don't take that to mean that the others ranked above it are necessarily a lot better. Nexus's early portion is relatively inoffensive. It's nothing you won't have seen before by this point in the campaign, combat deep within a Forerunner structure filled with fairly narrow areas, but it's serviceable and a face-off against a pair of Infinite's excellent hunters is always appreciated. Then comes comes quite the nosedive as it becomes a weird throwback to Halo 2 duo Sacred Icon and Quarantine Zone. This fall down a shaft, one very similar to that the Arbiter once experienced during Sacred Icon, is a sign of things to come, and it's followed by a slow-moving platform section that is arguably even less engaging than that featured at the end of Quarantine Zone. Hmm, that's not good. We're gonna need to find a way over this chasm. Can we use that gondola? Yes. Yes, we can. Get me over there. You sit there, waiting, you take out a few sentinels, you wait, and then do the same again, and this process repeats ad nauseum for roughly three minutes. It is absolute agony. The rest of the mission is also spent fighting sentinels, and it isn't exciting, although you're at least able to move at your own pace. Later story beats focused on Master Chief and the weapons relationship are intriguing enough, but look, I'm a gameplay man, and in that regard, only the first third of Nexus is remotely satisfying. Narrowly avoiding last and taking home the unenviable title of not quite the most terrible is Excavation Site, my choice for 14th. Taking a step back and looking at Halo Infinite's open world efforts in their totality, Excavation Site is markedly less compelling than any of its freeform siblings, except for perhaps Outpost Tremonius, which I'll get to shortly. While grapple shotting your way across Zeta Halo or trundling around in whatever vehicle, you'll occasionally find banished outposts, big bases which need to be cleared out, and usually house a few tasks to complete. Excavation Site is an area like those, except it's smaller, more slapdash, and harder to navigate. At no point when playing it do I ever get the impression much thought was put into how it's laid out, and it being so unintuitive to move around is all the more annoying thanks to the ridiculous number of enemies who soon fill the area. It's disappointing, as the mission it succeeds, the tower, shows early promise, promise 343 Industries, at least at this stage, fails to capitalise on. Your brush with Bassus and say, a bit of spice to proceedings. Spartan's not so tough, I think. Break open easy. Soft inside. Chief, I see him. But ultimately, he's a brute with a gravity hammer, and we've all seen that a million times before. I've chosen Repository as number 13, and I feel bad for it as it's in a tough spot. By the time you reach it, you'll have already played through two very similar levels in the form of Nexus and the Command Spire, which are both set within Forerunner environments. Together, they last an hour, maybe even 90 minutes, so you'll likely already be fatigued and itching to move on to something different before Repository even rolls around. Consequently, it really needed to be unique to stand out at all. Instead, however, it is as bland as can be. Honestly, it's mostly padding from beginning to end. There's a forgettable stroll through this massive room, boredom which is only occasionally punctuated by encounters with one or two sentinels. There's a huge detour, or rather two detours, to gather power seeds needed to activate a grav lift, something you'll have already done many times by this stage of the campaign. Finally, there are five straight minutes of cinematics which most notably reveal the fate of Doisak, the Brute's homeworld, an event which deserved far more exposition. Look upon Doisak one last time, and remember, you chose this path. After which, a couple of run-of-the-mill firefights round things out. More than any other entry on this list, Repository gives the impression of being a level built purely as a delivery mechanism for the story beats it contains, with everything else an afterthought. 
An argument could be made that 12th is a very generous placing for Outpost Tremonius given it's only 5 to 10 minutes long and is incredibly basic. All you have to do is follow a path up to a landing platform while dispatching any banished blocking you, hit a button, and that's that. At the same time, it doesn't actively irritate me like the two missions discussed prior. The remains of the UNSC ship Mortal Revery looming overhead gives the setting a splash of gravitas, and the reveal of Zeta Halo is a great moment. monsters coming to kill us. Simple but fun, I think, is the best way to sum up Outpost Tremonius, and although I'd love to push it higher up this list, its lack of content holds it back. Narrowly missing out on a place in my top 10 is Conservatory, a level which features a dead Spartan at either end, but is thankfully less depressing in between. While there are some repeat arenas during its first half, there's also a good amount of variety and space afforded to you, which can't always be said of the many Forerunner facilities. There are also barely any interruptions, and the opportunity to get stuck in over a long, uninterrupted stretch of gameplay is much appreciated. It's paced reasonably well too. Around the mission's midpoint, after that solid chunk of gameplay, you get your first look at the skimmers. I am despondent player, monitor of this installation, and this is my conservatory. My conservatory. This is not right. Perhaps you would... Oh no! And soon you have to fend off a huge number of them during a set piece that is memorable, if not overly exhilarating. As an aside, the fact I described this as one of Halo Infinite's more noteworthy sequences is my damning with faint praise. Conservatory also concludes in style, with Master Chief coming face to face with the Harbinger. She teases the return of the Endless and lays the smack down on our favourite Spartan before promptly disappearing, an entertaining way to bring what I consider to be the first act of the game to a close. Taking 10th spot is Foundation. With Foundation only Halo Infinite's second mission, it comes at a point in the campaign where intrigue needs to be built up, and overall 343 Industries succeeds in doing just that. You enter a cavernous room containing silexes filled with humans, you meet the weapon, Chief has visions of kids running around, you come across the first deceased Spartan, find even more silexes filled with other species, and may also stumble upon one adorned with a hologram that looks suspiciously flood-like. Warship Gabracken's primary function beforehand was was to introduce you to Infinite's gameplay, and Foundation does an equally good job of setting up Infinite's story while fostering an air of mystery. In gameplay terms, it's no slouch either, especially at this early stage where its type of environment still feels fresh. There aren't any skirmishes that really pile the pressure on, which is reasonable, remember the game's barely getting started, but that's no bad thing. With so many plot points to absorb in quick succession, combat maintaining an equally frantic tempo would result in an experience which feels like too much, too soon. Granted, there is a boss to contend with in the form of Tremonius. But what if it's a friend? It isn't. Esterum's order, or that you should be brought before him. He did not specify in how many pieces. But he shouldn't pose an issue as long as you keep your distance and use cover to your advantage. I'd be surprised if anyone chose Foundation as their favourite part of Infinite, or its worst, and so I think it being at the back of the middle of the pack is the perfect position for it. You might be asking why the Command Spire has sneaked into Night Spot when its opening 10 minutes are bang average. They are brown bread, they are the colour grey, they are lukewarm, filled with innocuous encounters with Banished and Sentinels, with a smattering of climbing mixed in for good measure. If you are a little bemused, I don't blame you. For a good while, it looks like the Command Spire has nothing of value to offer, then suddenly a lot happens. Adjutant Resolutions, Eta Halo's monitor, appearing to block your path for a second time might not be the biggest shock in the world, the massive room you fight him in screams boss battle from the moment you enter it, but your tussle with the AI is a decent challenge. Challenge. It's not the most imaginative, what with it basically being the same as your first clash except it's in a larger arena and you have to deal with sentinels at the same time, but it's a reasonable scaling up of trickiness which is rewarding to get through. Once Resolution and his mech suit have been given the boot, a set piece tasking you with beating back banished dropships swiftly follows, which is also awesome, before you're left with a cliffhanger ending. 
try not to get him killed too. Okay, let's get up. Uh, Chief? I have made videos ranking every Halo's levels, and none were more difficult to place than Halo Infinite. In part, that's because of the Forerunner missions all blending into one, but it's also due to there being several others which could have had markedly different placings depending on my mood, and the Command Spire definitely falls into that category. Over the last week or two, I've played through Halo Infinite in its entirety twice, back to back. If I'd have made this video before doing so, there's a good chance my number 8, The Sequence, would have been ranked the game's worst mission, or extremely close to it. There are no words capable of describing how loudly I groaned when I first heard this line. Plan B. Are we only at B? Seems higher. Okay. Plan B. and then looked at my map to see that there were four separate energy beacons I had to visit. I wasn't any more impressed when it turned out the interior of each tower was exactly the same as well. Open world dreck is how I mostly viewed the sequence. Over time though, and mostly due to those recent extra playthroughs, my view has softened. Don't get me wrong, like the Command Spire, this is still a level which could have finished in a very different position, but it being even where it is now when accounting for my previous opinion is honestly a minor miracle. Why has my stance changed so dramatically? Somewhat dramatically. A good part of it is to do with the outskirts of each energy beacon and the differing hurdles you have to overcome. It's not like that is something I'd never noticed before, but it stood out less previously. I'd pop over to each location between completing other open world busy work, which is probably what 343 Industries intended, using the beacons as a means to get you exploring Halo Infinite's largest region. Doing it like that, however, everything melded together into one big ball of mediocre box ticking, and it also didn't help that Pelican Down immediately prior does the same thing, but better. Due to how intensely I used to dislike the sequence, during my reset efforts I changed things up and visited them all one after the other, and the level was all the more enjoyable for it. Tackling them in a row made it easier to appreciate their uniqueness, be it this beacon which is surrounded by wraiths and ghosts, or this one which is guarded by hunters. It also helped the story beats flow better too. I'm not particularly fond of the amount of audio logs in the game, or that they're used as a substitute for real side stories, but the sequence is probably the best example of them being used properly. There is one within each beacon, and together they give you insight into what happened to the Endless on the Ring many, many years ago. To quickly conclude, I still wonder whether I've placed the sequence too highly, and I'm also fully expecting many of you to tell me that I'm underrating it too. The Silent Auditorium finishes 7th. This one I very much view as the climactic version of Foundation from the start of Halo Infinite's campaign. There, you work through fairly painless combat, which is interspersed with story designed to kick the game off. Conversely, during the Silent Auditorium, the combat is relentless, and it's broken up by scenes which serve to neatly, neatly-ish, tie up any loose ends. If you knew how you were going to die, how would you live your life differently? I would change nothing. Perfect. Thank you. What are you doing? Making things right. This first room is notable due to how extraordinarily brutal it is, pushing you to the absolute limit, and once you've emerged victorious, you're promptly met by two red hunters in a room with next to no cover. The rest of the level is similarly demanding too. Cortana's story also wraps, again, and you see the most of Atriox since he appeared during Infinite's opening, albeit as part of flashbacks with the AI, and while it's not the narrative most would have dreamt of prior to the game releasing, it at least draws a final line under her time in the series and heralds a fresh start, or at least I really blooming hope it does. When that's all said and done, a brawl with the Harbinger is all that remains. As with most bosses, you have to deplete her shield first, at which point you can deal some lasting damage. Every time you do so, waves of enemies of increasing difficulty spawn in to thwart you, which feels very cheap considering it's the campaign's finale. How difficult the Harbinger is to kill will also depend on her behaviour. If she backs off and fires electricity at you, you're going to have a tougher time than if she gets in close and misses most of her swipes. The mission's ending is also fine, although far too much is left unanswered, but as this is an infinite problem rather than one specific to Silent Auditorium, I haven't marked it down too much for that. 
The Road is Halo Infinite's designated Scorpion run. The Road only manages to come in at number 6 because that is both a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing in the least subtle manner possible, that is, it's blowing loads of stuff up in a tank while the series theme is blasted in the background. You mostly travel down a straight path that occasionally opens up into wider areas, which in fairness was a bungee halo design staple, and you're constantly surrounded by chaos as banished emerge from every corner ahead of you. It's big, it's bold, it's bombastic, and it provides the campaign with a much needed burst of energy following one or two straight hours spent in Forerunner facilities. It's a bad thing because in many ways the road is symptomatic of one of Infinite's biggest issues. At first glance, it's no different from any of the series' other Scorpion runs, except it is, as where in other games Scorpions are available as part of an array of options and you can choose to use them or not, in this campaign it's very clearly the Scorpion section and nothing else. It is the entire experience, rather than it being a single piece of something larger and more cohesive. Also, if you're going to be so prescriptive, then you have to ensure the tank in question controls well and isn't weak to the point it often feels like it's made out of paper mache. The announcement that Halo Infinite would be open world left me concerned right up until I was actually playing the game and reached 5th position in my ranking, The Tower. Earlier, I spoke of how Excavation Site was a wet blanket after The Tower's initial promise, and that's because the latter is really well designed. While it's likely you'll approach the towering structure from the front, you can use the grapple shot to breach its perimeter from multiple angles, and once you're within its walls, the area surrounding the grav lift you need to turn on immediately makes sense. There are three lanes and it's obvious how they connect, which which makes swinging around like a souped-up Spider-Man freeing marines who then join the fray a joy. You're given options, but 343 Industries also manages the space, which creates a happy medium between a closed-off traditional Halo level and Infinite's open-world stylings. When the dust has settled, you then head up into the tower. This portion of the level is criminally underused in terms of the opportunities for environmental storytelling, as it consists mainly of a few dark, dreary corridors populated by grunts and brutes. Your duel with Chaklock, one where your new newly acquired threat sensor is nigh on mandatory, ends the tower on a high note, however. Welcome to my tower, Master Chief. It is where you will be broken. It is where you will give up your secrets. It's so good, in fact, that 343 decides to do it twice, with your later confrontation with another elite, Jaegar Ardomni, playing out almost identically. The tower's closing scenes of Master Chief meeting the only living, temporarily living, Spartan you come across during the campaign are also touching, helping cap off 343's second, much more solid attempt at an open-world mission. Hmm, what's that I can smell? Is it the stench of what I reckon will perhaps be the most controversial opinion in the entire video? Quite possibly. Just missing out on a place on the podium is Spire. This level is not a complicated one. Once the Harbinger disappears at the end of Conservatory, you find yourself near, you guessed it, a Spire, and before you can access it, you'll need to clear out a veritable army of banished, including many piloting ghosts, as well as two hunters, an enemy you won't yet have met, who are brilliant. Inside, Adjutant Resolution makes your acquaintance, you have a brief chimwag while following him down a few hallways, before you then have to vanquish him as he attacks in his giant mech suit. It's the classic boss battle conceit of having to hit glowing weak points, and I love it, nearly as much as I love this fantastic ending cinematic. Spire is short but sweet, and I wouldn't change it for the world. This video's bronze medalist is House of Reckoning. Like Spire before it, this mission is quite straightforward, but it has the edge thanks to its atmosphere. In addition to serving as banished leader Esherim's base of operations, the House of Reckoning was also the destination for many UNSC prisoners, who were forced to take part in a series of trials. You visit three of the areas where these tests were held, and they are great fun. During the first two, ever stronger groups of banished flood the room, and you really have to keep your wits about you to avoid being swamped almost immediately. 
Bay. Luckily for you, each arena is filled with scavenged UNSC equipment, so as long as you keep moving to avoid getting surrounded while gradually thinning the herd, you should be able to get through both relatively unscathed. Or maybe not, as even on easier difficulties, these sections are not for the faint of heart. The third houses the husk of a pelican, within which you have to fend off Jaegar Ardomni, the only member of Eshram's rogues gallery left standing, except of course for the big man himself. As mentioned, having already defeated Chaklok, it's nothing new, but with the engagement unfolding in closer quarters and the elite being particularly aggressive, you'll need to put past experience to good use in order to survive. Throughout all of this, Eshram taunts you continually, and soon it's his turn to die. Your scuffle with him is a touch more original than the one which precedes it. You're mostly on the back foot, avoiding the hulking brute as much as possible while destroying a series of power relays which prevent you from harming him. Even when vulnerable, Eshram can still take a shed load of damage, but he's also very slow, so the best strategy is to create as much distance as you can before unloading into what is a pretty large target. An unexpectedly touching moment between the two soldiers concludes House of Reckoning, an outing which is, for my money, Halo Infinite's most intense. I am a firm believer that being comfortable admitting when you are wrong is an important personality trait to have, and friends, I think I may have been wrong, but only ever so slightly, a while back when I proclaimed that Pelican Down is Halo Infinite's best level. As I said, only by the tiniest margin though, as it's still my second favourite. With regards to open world missions, Master Chief's quest to destroy three anti-aircraft guns is by far and away the campaign's best. Granted, that's not saying much when The Tower, a middling to decent adventure, is its closest rival, but don't let that fool you into thinking Pelican Down is of similar quality, because it isn't. It's way better. As to why, well, there are three reasons. For one thing, much like the sequence which follows, each objective has a different selection of enemies guarding it. You have to contend with Jackal Snipers and Hunters at the East Gun, the North Gun is surrounded by ghosts, and the West Gun is protected by an absurd number of banished foot soldiers. Another plus is that the area is semi-open and visually distinctive. The ship graveyard in its middle is the connective tissue between the three guns, providing a memorable backdrop while giving you freedom, but not too much freedom. It helps the experience feel curated in a way no other mission which unfolds on Zeta Halo's surface can match. Last but not least, Hyperius and Tavares, the two brute Spartan killers who arrive when the guns have been destroyed, combine to create a boss encounter that is second to none. In my view, it's the best in the game. After what is a fairly meaty mission, you're also rewarded with this excellent cut scene at the point where Chief, the pilot, and the weapon start to feel like a proper team. This is all I've got. It's all we need. Our only way home is straight through the heart of the banished. We need you. We can fix this. Together. It's unfortunate that 343 Industries only managed to really nail the Halo in an open world formula once, as a few more levels like Pelican Down would have gone a long way towards justifying their decision to depart from the series' wholly linear roots. Warship Gabracken should have maybe been named Warship Absolutely Cracking, as it is terrific. One of Bungie's strongest pieces of work remains to this day Halo's very first level, Pillar of Autumn, due to how they introduce mechanics in a way which makes sense in world. 343 clearly took a few cues from it, as they do an equally stellar job and even throw in the odd near-direct reference. This grenade hallway, which gives you time and space to get to grips with explosives, is very reminiscent to that featured in Pillar of Autumn, for example. They also push you to start taking advantage of the grapple shot numerous times too, to navigate the environment and to gain the upper hand during combat. Warship Gabracken continues to be traditional in the best way possible when it comes to setting. Along with Master Chief's maiden outing in Combat Evolved, Halo 2's Cairo Station continues the trend of beginning on a ship, or orbital platform, same difference, sort of, with Halo 4 also following the trend. I genuinely believe Infinite's take might be the best of the bunch too, matched only perhaps by Pillar of Autumn. The tutorialization is handled well, but the encounter design is also top-notch, there's plenty of exposition, and generally it has that Halo swagger 
which was so often missing from 4 and 5. I adore the set piece which rounds things out too. I realise I've barely mentioned Infinite's music so far, which is criminal really as it's superb, so allow me to do so again here. Racing through the ship as it falls apart, using the grapple shot to swing between falling containers and dodging enemies and explosions in hallways while Gabrak and Escape plays is wonderful. If Warship Pabrakum were featured in one of Bungie's titles, it would be held in very high regard, and it should be anyway, as its quality is plain to see. It's a great shame, then, that when it comes to 343 nailing the classic Halo feel, it's pretty much all you get. It is the beautiful exception which proves the rule. And so, we've reached the end of my ranking. As I alluded to once or twice, I found Halo Infinite's levels harder to place than any other game in the series, with many of them being shuffled round multiple times before I finally settled on the order you've seen here. Hopefully, I've got them spot on, but if I said I was confident, I'd be telling Porky Pies. And with that, thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and Spartans. If you'd rank it highly, do consider liking, subscribing and sharing your thoughts, and all's well, we'll catch up again soon.